a lot of my work focuses in on how do we connect someone with a size friendly care provider from the start, from the jump, so that there's not a lot of these more invasive recommendations being made based solely off of BMI near the end of pregnancy that aren't always necessarily evidence-based. They're more, it feels more like fear-based. Are there increased risks? Yes, but people who are 36 have increased risk. So we need to meet people where they're at and provide individualized healthcare in a compassionate manner to help not only empower people during pregnancy, but for the rest of their lives to believe that they deserve compassionate, evidence-based healthcare. Giving birth is one of the most significant events of your life. Sadly, the joy that you should feel can often be replaced with anxiety and helplessness instead. As a labor and delivery nurse, I'm revealing insider information to educate you, reassure you, and decrease your fear. In this podcast, you'll hear empowering birth stories and experts weigh in on a range of topics. Being Jewish also has me exploring Judaism's influence on the reproductive experience. However, I speak to anyone wishing to navigate their journey with more joy and confidence. I'm your host, Hani Fingerer, and you're listening to the Happy Birthway Podcast. Welcome to episode 54 of the Happy Birthway Podcast. I'm sorry that I'm one week late in releasing this podcast. I have been so busy in camp and just kind of living in an alternate reality here. And today is actually my last full day of camp. I am busy packing and I have such mixed feelings. On the one hand, I just love being here. It's kind of like an alternate reality. I, I, I don't have a better term for it. Um, someone else is disciplining my kids for the most part. So that part's nice. Um, and I'm not as busy with doctor's appointments and grocery shopping and just the general overall responsibilities of life. I'm actually a little bit in denial of all the stuff that I have to do and the list keeps accumulating in my head of all the back to school stuff that I'm going to have to take care of. But I made it a priority to release this episode. It is an excellent episode with Jen McClellan, who is an advocate for those who are plus sized. And she just knows how to synthesize the fact that plus sized people do have extra health considerations. There's no denying that. But at the same time, she manages to humanize it and to take the stigma out of it. She's someone who's presented to prestigious obstetrical organizations, including ACOG, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. So I have tremendous respect for her. Those of you who are not plus size should still listen to this episode because it might open your eyes a little bit to those who are struggling with the stigma that comes with being big. Before the episode starts, I wanted to introduce to you another great podcast by a from woman, and that is The Francisca Show. I enjoy listening to her podcast. I enjoyed listening to it way before I started my own podcast. Uh, She's also one of the original from female podcasters, and she just finds the most interesting people to interview and talk about the most interesting topics. So I highly recommend that you go check out her podcast and it will be linked in the episode show notes. Hi, I'm Francisca, host of the Francisca Show podcast. Would you like to hear stories from your everyday firm person as well as therapists and other experts about the dynamics of balancing both the Jewish Orthodox and the human experience life? Then check out my show, The Francisca Show Podcast, with over 200 episodes out and a new one every week. You can access entertaining and behind-the-scenes stories where I give a voice to Jewish issues around women's topics, sexuality, halacha, culture, and family. It's the F-R-A-N-C-I-S-K-A Show. See you there. I am so excited and just honored to be interviewing Jen McClellan. She is a published author, founder of Plus Size Birth, and host of the Plus Mommy podcast. She helps people navigate the world of plus size pregnancy, shares tips for embracing your body, and laughs her way through the adventures of parenthood. Her work has been featured in major publications such as the New York Times, Glamour, Today's Parent, Huffington Post, and International Doula. As a public speaker, Jen has spoken at numerous events, including presenting at the National Institutes of Health. Jen is also a certified childbirth educator, 
wife and mother to a charismatic 11 year old. Jen, welcome to the happy birthday podcast. This is such an incredible honor. Oh, I'm, I'm touched. Thank you for having me on your show. I adore you. And I'm so thankful for the work and the wisdom you're putting out into the world. So thank you. Thank you. And you have quite the impressive profile. I mean, the NIH, like, that's huge. And I'm so happy that there are people out there like you getting this information out to the medical community where unfortunately, they've been trained in a very different way, you know, and I see this currently in my work right now. Yeah, when NIH uh, reached out because they were putting together an initiative around obesity and pregnancy, and they wanted the consumer perspective um, and saw all the work that I was doing. And we had a conference call and I was like, I know this is like not professional, but I'm totally crying right now because I'm like, you care. You want to hear the perspective of people in larger bodies and what we experience during a plus size pregnancy. And then also, you know, I, I do have some credentials, but not the credentials. I mean, I was sitting in a room with leaders in maternal health care, like ACOG spoke after me. <laughs> so it was like, hi, I'm Jen. But it was such a normalized experience because we were staying in a hotel room together and then we took a van over to the NIH campus and they were like, Oh, your your dress is so pretty. And they were talking about road construction. I'm like, Oh, you're like amazing humans, but you're human and you put on your underwear one leg at a time too. So yes, it was an amazing experience. Um, but I was just so thankful that, you know, such a prestigious group of people wanted to hear, Um, what it's really like to be pregnant and plus size, because from your own experiences, too, I mean, and the people that you serve, it is different. And people are especially treated different as well. So yeah, it was a real honor to have that experience. Um, You know, there's so much, I feel like misinformation online when you're pregnant and exist in a larger body. When you go into Google, there's so much like doom and gloom when, when we really look at the evidence, if someone is you know, we can have health at every size. So if you exist in a larger body, but you don't already have high blood pressure or a pre-diabetic, I mean, the odds of having a healthy outcome are more than, well, much high on your side. But that's not the message that society tells us or the medical community tells us. And a lot of what I do is trying to, you know, flip the script to empower people with evidence-based information to help them feel like they can have a healthy outcome. And even if they don't, it's not their fault because as you know, people of all sizes get gestational diabetes. Yes, and being in a bigger body, first of all, A, is not someone's fault. I mean, there are so many factors that play into it and I absolutely hate that bias that unfortunately too many medical professionals have toward people in bigger bodies that they caused it, that it was something that they did, that they're gluttonous and all the other unfortunate biases that they have. And B, even if it were, I mean, people make so many choices in life that can affect the health outcomes of their pregnancy. And the comments that I hear myself from physicians, nurses, are just sometimes so appalling. I don't think it would pass for any other population to speak that way about them. And I'm so happy that somebody like you is changing that and educating doctors and ACOG so that they can view things differently and stop with the doom and gloom. Yeah, because I feel like all we want is healthy outcomes, right? <laughs> you, you know, we're doing this work for over a decade now. I've had like, you know, trolls on social media and I'm like, But all I want to do is have people have access to information on how to be healthy and feel empowered during pregnancy. Like, I don't understand the the bias around it is very frustrating because we're literally setting up people to raise and nurture other humans. Why would we want to shame them in the process? It makes no sense to me, but we all come into life with these internalized biases. And then it wrenches my heart when it's not just people who exist in larger bodies, it's also people who are black and exist in a larger body or Jewish and exist in a larger body. And there are so many different marginalizations and then people are so mistreated. And at the end of the day, you just want to bring it down to like, um, you know, talking to our young children about like, don't be me. <laughs> like, it's a real simple concept. Are there increased risks? Yes, but people who are, you know, 30, 
six have increased risk. So we need to meet people where they're at and provide individualized healthcare in a compassionate manner to help not only empower people during pregnancy, but for the rest of their lives to believe that they deserve compassionate evidence-based healthcare. People who are in bigger bodies already come into the medical system afraid and self-conscious and feeling judged and often avoid even getting timely care. So a lot of it is what came first, the chicken or the egg. Are they being treated not as well as somebody who's smaller? Are they being told that the solution to every problem that they have is just to lose weight? Um, and things are being overlooked, unfortunately, yes. And I'll, I'll tell you even something small, for example, we are very careful in repositioning patients when they have an epidural, right? Because we don't want them to get, uh, I mean, many reasons, but there is a consideration that somebody who's lying in bed for a long time may develop a pressure ulcer. Um, which is, you know, skin damage, skin breakdown. And so that's one of the reasons why it's so important to reposition patients. And sometimes I think that nurses may be more resistant um, or neglectful of repositioning a bigger patient because they feel like, oh, it's harder. So they will get that subpar care. That's, that's terrible. Again, so it's the what came first, the chicken or the egg, and bringing that awareness. And there's so many different factors too. Like I can look on your side in your defense of you're understaffed. You know, most labor and delivery nurses are understaffed. And yes, anyone of any size moving, it's hard to move anyone of any size, right? So you're going to need extra hands. You're going to need another labor and delivery nurse to help assist in a move. And not everyone has full staff. So I think it's a multi-prong issue that we need to be addressing in healthcare that we're failing people of all sizes during pregnancy, but especially people of size. And we have some new technology, right? Like the Novi Monica um, wireless monitor that we know was designed for people with a high BMI, but you're lucky if you see one on an L&D floor versus in every room when you know, wireless um, monitors allow for more movement for people of all sizes during labor. And we want that movement, not only for their comfort and avoiding, you know, what you just shared, but also, you know, to help just send the baby (laughs) down for childbirth too, right? So um, yeah, it's just frustrating. I would love to hear about things like additional medical interventions that may not be necessary that are recommended for people of size just because they have higher risk because they have quote unquote, a high BMI, which I hate Uh, the BMI system is archaic and completely not evidence-based. So I have to say that, but unfortunately the medical system still uses it. So what can you tell us about that? Like what myths, where's the research um, with that? If somebody is of size and their provider is saying, oh, you need to have an induction or they are being told that they cannot give birth in a birth center because they risk out just because of their size and no other health reasons. Um, Can you speak to that? Can you tell us a little bit about the research? Sure. You know, it, it's so care provider specific, because when we look at, um, you know, the recommendations that ACOG has um, in their committee opinion on obesity and pregnancy, there are a few things that they recommend that are evidence based in pregnancy, like being tested twice for gestational diabetes. So they're testing early on. But what I find is there's not a conversation around it. There's just like, okay, here's your first glucose screen. And people are like, okay, and then they take their glucose screen and most of the time pass. And then come 24 to 28 weeks into their pregnancy, they're like, okay, it's time for your glucose screen. And they're like, oh, but I already passed that. But what they're looking for initially is to see if someone is already pre-diabetic or diabetic. So there are some things that are recommended, but there's not the conversation around it. Um, ACOG will also recommend um, referral to nutritionists. And I always recommend that people, if, um, you know, we don't want to make assumptions that people of any sizes don't know a lot about nutrition, because frankly, I think people exist in larger bodies probably know a lot more (laughs) about nutrition, but 
it's more so, um, you know, diet culture has been so ingrained in our brains that you think, oh, I've got to, you know, not gain a lot of weight during pregnancy, because that's another recommendation that is made. Um, so people think, oh, I have to restrict, which isn't the case. But I always encourage people, you know, if you want to meet with a nutritionist, I think that's incredible, because there's so much that we've you know, misconstrued in our brains because of diet culture, but try to connect with the health at every size nutritionist. Um, and then I did mention the weight gain guidelines. So for anyone with a BMI over 30, you're looking at a recommendation of about 11 to 20 pounds. Um, and that is an evidence-based recommendation because we see lower rates of um, different complications during pregnancy if there's not a lot of weight gain. But again, there's not the conversation often that's taking place of here's why this recommendation is. And for those who exist in a larger body, we often don't see a lot of weight gain. And some people even sometimes occasionally lose a little bit of weight, but that should never be the focus. There's not a recommendation to lose weight. Um, but some care providers say they want people to lose weight. So it's very, you know, care providers set their own guidelines and safeguards. Um, you know, sometimes... Uh, near the end of pregnancy, we see, you know, an extra ultrasound or two to see if, you know, check on the baby's positioning, um, to check on um, the size of the baby. And that's a whole nother conversation we could have. But so those are things that we see routinely. Now, ACOG doesn't recommend induction based on only BMI. Um, they don't recommend a uh, high risk labeling based only upon BMI. But those are things that we see very often, especially, um, you know, that label of high risk. And so that's something that I've always been anxious about of when, when or if will that happen, because it really limits access to care. And like you said, early on, you know, birth centers, many birth centers have BMI restrictions where a person can't even get that initial visit, right? And we know that the midwifery model of care tends to have, um, you know, lower cesarean birth rate uh, outcomes. And we want to help reduce that cesarean birth rate, especially for people in a higher BMI, because the rates are so high. So I know that was a lot that I just shared, but those are, you know, some of the, some of the recommendations don't align with all these interventions that we see during labor and birth that aren't aren't blanket recommendations. They're really care provider specific. So a lot of my work focuses in on how do we connect someone with a size friendly care provider from the start, from the jump, so that there's not a lot of these um, more invasive recommendations being made based solely off of BMI near the end of pregnancy that aren't always necessarily evidence-based. They're more, it feels more like fear-based. Before we continue, I wanted to let you know about a revolutionary diaper brand called Diaper, D-Y-P-E-R. These eco-friendly diapers are made with viscose from bamboo, so they're soft on your baby's skin while still being extra absorbent to handle your baby's biggest accidents. Diaper wants to pass on the savings directly to you by cutting out the middleman. They ship your diapers to you for a low, predictable price with no extras or gotchas. Set your subscription and let them deliver the exact quantity you need. If you need more, they'll deliver them promptly with their exclusive SOS service. If you need less, send them back with a prepaid label. You can precisely manage your deliveries using their website or their mobile app. One of the products that I think is really cool is their diaper sense. It's a small sensor that you attach to your baby's diaper and it continuously monitors the temperature and humidity surrounding their skin. It will help you optimize your diaper changes, reduce overall diaper use, and may help reduce instances of skin rash due to prolonged exposure to moisture. All you do is snap it to the outside of the diaper and connect it to diapers app. It will notify you when number one or number two happens. Subscribe through the link in my show notes and you will get a free bonus diaper bag just for trying them out. You can cancel any time with no obligation, but still keep the bag. Kiwi Co. Crates are a monthly subscription of crates that come filled with age-appropriate STEAM projects for kids, from toddlers to teenagers and even adults. STEAM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Art, and Math. Every crate explores a different theme designed to spark creativity, thinking, and learning. All projects, inspiration, and activities are created by a team of product designers in-house and rigorously tested by kids. 
KiwiCo offers all different product lines spanning a variety of interests and age ranges. Panda Crate is for babies from 0 to 24 months. Each crate helps babies learn by doing what they do best, playing, exploring, and most importantly, interacting with the people in their lives. Crates arrive every other month and are filled with two months worth of content. So if you're trying to figure out what a developmentally appropriate way to interact with your baby is, Panda Crates will take the guesswork out. For an exclusive 30% off discount on your first month subscription, go to KiwiCo.com, that's K-I-W-I-C-O.com, and enter code LEARN30 at checkout. That's KiwiCo.com, code LEARN30 at checkout. That's crazy to think that ACOG doesn't say that in and of itself a high BMI is a reason to classify someone as high risk unless, you know, they may be at higher risk for developing some complications, but in and of itself, if they don't develop any complications, which I've seen plenty of times, um, that's pretty scary to think that doctors are still telling patients that you're high risk and you have to have an early induction, which we know um, you know, can lead possibly to a C-section, you know, greater likelihood of having a C-section and other interventions. Surgery for people with who are larger um, can have different implications that, you know, factors that we need to consider that may just make things a little bit more complex for them. And so we, like you said, we want to actually avoid a C-section as much as we can for everyone, but it can be extra beneficial for someone of size to avoid a C-section. So like you said, if in and of itself, that's the only thing that someone has, then to be denied to give birth in a childbirth center that has such an extremely low rate of C-section exponentially so makes me sad. Yeah, there was a study done, I think it was in 2017, that looked at induction of people with a higher BMI and they did not find a higher rate of cesarean birth. And what I what I saw happen after that study came out um, was that we started getting more recommendations for induction for people with higher BMI based on this one study that showed that there wasn't it didn't correlate to a higher cesarean birth rate. Which th- that's great, right? I'm glad that we have that data. But I I guess as childbirth educator, as someone who's had an unmedicated birth, as someone who really feels it's important to meet people where they're at, I get really anxious about a blanket recommendation of induction. To me, it just seems so counterintuitive. And it does feel like it it, it increases risk, even though this one study showed it didn't force cesarean birth. So that's, that's a tough one. I feel like my own personal biases get wrapped up in how I feel about that. But I just feel like I get really anxious when they're like, oh, well, we just shouldn't induce people of size at 39 weeks. And I'm like, ah, <laughs> I'm like, no, I don't. I think we should really provide individualized health care. And I always feel like, you know, if someone wants extra testing, if they want to be labeled as high risk, so they're getting extra ultrasounds and they have concerns, if they want to be induced, I mean, that's great. I want to meet people where they're at, but I, I just am very concerned about having, you know, interventions being the standard of care when we look at, you know, advanced maternal age where people are labeled as high risk. And then we do see the same with, uh, you know, higher BMI, much higher rates of cesarean birth and interventions and so many things that become this kind of like little, little tidal wave that builds. Um, And do we look at, you know, postpartum rates and breastfeeding and chest feeding rates after all these things? Like, I don't think it's just the cesarean birth. There's so many other things and the recovery and, and, you know, increased risk for um, additional blood loss and higher rates of postpartum infections for people of size as well. So, yeah, there's so much that goes into it, but it's really important when someone is connecting with a care provider early on in pregnancy that they're asking those questions. Will you label me as high risk based only upon my BMI? Do you recommend induction based only upon my BMI? You know, those things are really important. And of course, if you develop a complication, then you'll want to have interventions and have, you know, closer monitoring and additional ultrasounds, of course. Um, but to, to have these things just happen as standard of care, I, I have some concerns in terms of finding a size friendly care provider, 
you gave us some great questions for someone to be asking their existing care provider to help them determine if they feel like this care provider is a size friendly care provider. And with inductions, I mean, a C-section is not the only consideration for why somebody wouldn't want to have an induction. It's also just a personal preference. People don't want to have to go through an induction, especially if at 39 weeks, it's a first time mom whose cervix is not open and who may be there for three for three days getting that induction. That's not fun for many people. And for someone who, um, you know, doesn't want to have pain medication during birth, there are so many other reasons why somebody wouldn't want an induction. So C-section is not the only thing. I was wondering if you had any other advice for trying to find a size-friendly care provider. Sure. I have a whole free guide on plussizebirth.com on how to connect with a size-friendly care provider because the the two biggest questions I get asked, number one, how do I find plus-size maternity clothes, you know, that are affordable and cute because still to this day, I can't believe we've been doing this work for a decade and it's still hard to find plus-size maternity clothes, but um, there's that. And then the second question is, how do I connect with a size friendly care provider? So people can download that for free, but it really starts with, you know, asking around your friends. I encourage people to join a local Facebook group for parents. And then if you feel comfortable posting in there, like, Hey, I'm plus size. Any other plus size moms have a care provider they loved just so you can start getting some local names and then doing your research, like, you know, Google them, look into them. Um, When you show up for that, or before you even show up for that first appointment, calling ahead, you know, ask, do you have any BMI restrictions? Do you have a large size blood pressure cuff? Do you have larger gowns? Like, those are real big indicators of whether or not a facility is size inclusive. It absolutely baffles my brain that there are still providers that don't have larger blood pressure cuffs. Like, I'm just like, how is that still, I just... I don't understand that at all. We're not talking about a piece of equipment that costs thousands of dollars. We're costing, we're talking about something that costs $20. And with an inaccurate size cuff being used, people are being told they have high blood pressure when they don't. That's literally below the standard of care. Like that is not an accurate measurement. Although if your provider doesn't have one, which I, I'm shocked to actually hear this, that's absolutely ridiculous. Um, just know that you can ask for them to take it on your uh, lower forearm b- below your elbow, because that is a way to do that. But oh my gosh, I hope nobody is using a provider like that. That's- but it's, yeah. And there is an alternative, but it's not always as accurate. And the automated ones aren't always as accurate. Um, so just those types of things. And then when you arrive, is there a place for you to sit comfortably? Or do all the chairs in the lobby have arms? Like, are you comfortable? Do you feel welcome? Uh, What are the materials around? Is it a bunch of, you know, I I went to a medical facility once that just had all this Botox and other cosmetic stuff all around, which great. I mean, you do you, I was in LA, but, um, but if the facility has a bunch of like weight loss products and all cosmetic stuff, like maybe that just might not feel like a safer space for you. So really trusting your gut, trusting your intuition, and then asking your care provider questions. If you do feel comfortable sharing any previous, um, you know, bias that you've experienced from care providers, can you talk to them? That's been something that I've found has been really effective is to just humanize your experience. You know, hi, my name is Jen. I've been mistreated by care providers in the past and I'm feeling scared right now, or I'm feeling whatever you're feeling. Uh, it's almost always care providers stop for a second of their routine lists of questions that they only have 15 minutes to ask you. And they look you in the eye and say, I'm really sorry that has happened. You know, I want you to feel comfortable, you know? So it, it's sad that we even have to humanize ourselves, but just like I defended labor and delivery nurses of not having enough their hands and time and, you know, people to support same goes for care providers, you know, especially in the obstetrical model of care, we're looking at like 15 minute visits, that is not enough time. And so yes, recommendations are sometimes made that you're not getting full informed consent, because there just isn't time for it. And that is so wrong. But, um, you know, how do you maximize the time? How do you get someone to look at you in your eyes and be like, Oh, you know, this isn't just an, a name or a BMI on my chart. This is someone 
who's becoming a parent and who wants to be treated with compassion and dignity. And it's sad that we even need to take those steps, but they've become really important to take. Oh, that's great. I love that script that you said, letting your care provider know, and you can take that to the labor and delivery unit too, when you're giving birth, even if somebody is not really conscious about being size friendly, that can actually stop them in their tracks and let them take a moment to process that. I don't think that care providers or any, you know, many medical professionals really think about that. Yeah. And we have studies to show that when someone feels shamed by a care provider, they are less likely to receive routine health care and more likely to gain weight. And I can share that from personal experience. I was horrifically shamed many years ago and was struggling to breathe and was told that maybe I needed to be on oxygen because I was so big. And meanwhile, if they had just read my chart, I got like medical approval to do a 5K earlier. Like I was really being more physically active, but I was having problems breathing. And they literally just like, well, pretty much made me feel like I didn't deserve to breathe. And even I doing this work and knowing the stats, like I became a statistic. I literally gained about 60 pounds after that experience because I felt like my care provider felt like I didn't deserve to breathe and I didn't, I didn't deserve to be, to exist. And isn't that sad? Meanwhile, during pregnancy, why I started doing this work is because it was the first time I felt like a care provider touched my body with compassion and made me feel like my body was capable of having a healthy outcome. And that was my midwife. And it was such a just dramatic change in how I felt about my body and my uh, my abilities. And then all, all, a couple years later, I have this horrific experience. And then I go right back to feeling well, like, am I even worthy of great health care? So and I'm a professional that does this work, you know, for a living and teaches people how to advocate for themselves. So, but it's so hard when you exist in a larger body and you are so mistreated and then you feel so lucky that someone treats you with compassion. Like that's the bar and it's so low and it's not even being met for so many people. And so, so much damage is occurring. I wrote this article on, you know, people being told their vagina is too fat to birth their baby. And this is happening. And, and when I go and I speak, um, you know, I really try to talk about, it's not just in that moment when a care provider says, well, your vagina, um, you know, it might be too fat to birth your baby. It's how that person internalizes that message with intimacy with their partner, with self-esteem about their body, with their even ability to birth, let alone to you know, embrace themselves, like it can really damage someone's self esteem and self confidence and self worth. And there's no evidence to back this up. I hired a researcher, I paid a researcher to dig into because to me, it made no sense. What does that even mean having a fat vagina? Right, like, what is it lined right. with fat? It, there's no fat that it's lined with, it stretches. That's what we found is that there were studies that found that yes, while the first stage of labor can take longer for people who exist in a larger body. So while we're, we're dilating to 10, right? We're getting ready to give birth. That can take longer. Pushing tends to be shorter. So there's no like, it's, it's not a fat vagina. If we know that pushing for people with a higher BMI can actually be shorter. Are there concerns about soft tissue dystocia, shoulder dystocia? Yes. Are there some slight increased risk, very slight, very slight. But you as you know, an LND nurse know how to navigate those situations for people of all sizes, right? But there's nothing to say that someone's vagina can be so fat that they need to have a cesarean birth. And yet that is what is happening. Is it extremely common? No, but it's happening enough that when I do a posting on social media, I will get the stories flooded of people saying this happened to me. And that is horrifying. So yeah, I paid a researcher to dig into it because I was like, this, this can't be a thing. Like anecdotally, I know it's not, but I want someone to really dig in. Um, and yeah, they found the opposite to prove that actually pushing can be shorter. <laughs> I have the article on plus size birth. I can send it to you to be in the show notes. Yes. Um, but we need to advocate for people of size to have more time during that first stage of labor, right? And we've known this for a long time. 
And we're hearing this more and more now, finally, like these are old studies that um, people of size just take longer. We think it might take longer with, you know, the oxytocin coursing through their bodies. Um, you know, just like we see higher rates of um, postpartum bleeding for people of size. It just, you know, our hormones are a little different when we exist in larger bodies. Sometimes um, things can be a little slower, just need a little more time um, to be able to hopefully have a vaginal birth as opposed to just being like, oh, well, it's been 12 hours since water's broke, it's time to have that cesarean. Um, so when we can advocate for a little bit more time and more movement, right? And using a peanut ball and using a birth ball if we're with an epidural, waiting longer to get that epidural whenever possible. But of course, meeting people where they're at with, the, with pain medication if they want that, of course, of course. I have to tell you, the things that I've heard from people's experiences are absolutely appalling. I recently had someone on social media message me and tell me that for her first few babies, she didn't get an epidural. She had maybe, I think, six babies. For her first like four children, she did not get an epidural. And then for the last two, she did and she loved it and she's so happy. And, you know, we were just discussing people why they made a choice to get one or not and all of that. And I asked her why, and she told me that for her first birth, she asked for an epidural and an anesthesiologist came and told her that it's almost impossible that they'll get an epidural in because she had too much back fat. And she said she was so ashamed that she didn't even ask them to try. And they basically set her up into this mindset that like, it's probably not even going to happen. And just that shame of exposing herself like that and having it fail and not happen where I actually think like this anesthesiologist was probably not going to make it happen just because they already set themselves up that way. Right. And she was denied pain medication, which is unethical. Having a fussy, nonstop crying baby can take all the joy out of motherhood. Is it gas? Is it constipation? Is it colic? It's hard to know, but there is a solution for all of those. Happy Tummy is a waistband that comes with an herbal pouch. When you microwave the pouch and apply the waistband to your fussy baby, your baby is instantly soothed. That's thanks to natural formulation of herbs, including flaxseed, chamomile, lemongrass, peppermint, spearmint, and lavender. Happy Tummy is all natural, no drugs or drops. And not only does it quickly soothe your baby, but but it smells terrific. Happy Tummy also has adult size waistbands, which mothers love for cramps, stomach aches, and back aches. Use my code Happy Birthway for 10% off your whole order on happytummy.com. That's H A P P I T U M M I.com. Code Happy Birthway for 10% off. If you have been struggling with nausea and vomiting from your pregnancy, Emmaterm might be the answer for you. Emmaterm is a safe and effective anti-nausea wristband that prevents and relieves nausea and vomiting induced by pregnancy or motion, such as car and boat rides. It releases a low-frequency pulse that travels through the body's nervous system to the part of the brain which controls the stomach. This interrupts the nausea signal pathways. Emmaterm is FDA cleared and designed to put you in control when you need drug-free therapy with no worries about potential side effects. Users can choose from five levels of intensity to achieve the best effect. The unique wristband design holds the device in place and makes it easy to put on and take off. It is FSA and HSA eligible, comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee and a one-year warranty. Go to emmaterm.com, that's E-M-E-T-E-R-M.com and use code HAPPYBIRTHWAY for 20% off of your purchase. You can find the link in the episode show notes. It is unethical yeah. to withhold pain medication from any patient in any situation, labor or any other medical place to withhold pain medication from them when they request it. So to me, hearing that was absolutely appalling. And when I shared that, then I had other people telling me that their epidural didn't work well. And they were told that's because of their weight. And I said, well, they could have raised the dose. Mm -hmm. And giving you more medication because sometimes we have to do weight based dosing where if someone's yeah. larger, then they need a higher dose for their body to metabolize it. These are prime examples of the biases and the discrimination that people of size experience in the medical care system. I, but I remember that story because I shared it too. And then people were flooding my inbox too. But you even said that you've seen people of 400 plus pounds get an epidural without issues. So it's really again, care provider specific, right? So 
Um, maybe that anesthesiologist it has a bias or maybe they just haven't been trained on how to find the markers for people in larger bodies. So for someone who is in that situation asking, you know, is there another anesthesiologist here at this facility or when will there be another one here? Um, just so you can advocate for yourself. But yes, when you're really literally felt like you're stripped of your humanity or you you can't have access to this because of your size, when in fact we know that people of, you know, so many different sizes have, can get an epidural. Um, it's, yeah, it's shocking. And it, it, it stays with people, right? It doesn't just, that impact doesn't end after they leave that hospital. It stays with them for a really long time, quite often. And, you know, it's, it's, we see higher rates of postpartum depression for people of size. I don't know if that's, from a lot of the biases that occur, but I could imagine that, you know, birth trauma plays a role in how we see postpartum mental health um, show up. And it's just, again, all that we're asking for is to meet people where they're at and pe treat people with dignity. If you can't place an epidural on a person in a larger body, then find another colleague that can. And unfortunately, with an anesthesiologist, the options are far more limited than uh, L and D nurse that is fat phobic, and you can just ask the charge nurse for a new nurse. You know, it's not always as accessible, but you can ask um, and see if, if unfortunately there isn't someone else, what whether their pain medications are optional. But it's just shocking to me that yeah, someone would even have to fight for that at all. Yeah, and even if you get another anesthesiologist and you get what you deserve, pain relief wise, the emotional impact of hearing something like that about your body that you have too much back fat is just so humiliating yeah. and so unnecessary to be told that. We hear from people that, you know, get cancer and don't go to the doctor for years and years and years, and the lump gets bigger and bigger, but they're too afraid of being fat shamed to deal with something that they're seeing growing in their body. I mean, people are literally dying because of the medical bias against people of size. So we talked about increased risks for developing complications if you're larger. But I remember once seeing your stories on Instagram and you were saying how the increased risk relative to somebody who is not of a bigger size is really not as crazy as we we think it is. So like you were saying how to develop gestational diabetes, uh, let's say someone of size is told that their risk is, I'm giving out random numbers that are not true. If, if they have a 20% a great, you know, likelihood of developing gestational diabetes, which to them can be like, oh my God, like one in five chances that I might develop gestational diabetes. Whereas somebody who's of smaller size has a 15% chance of developing diabetes. So it's not that much of a greater risk as somebody would think it is definitely a greater risk. There's no denying that. So can you please speak to that? Yeah, you almost got the numbers exactly right. Yes, a lot of what we've shared during our time together has been really intense and polarizing. So I apologize to any listeners that are like, ah, um, but as we said in the beginning, the odds of having a healthy outcome are on your side. And when we look and dig into the evidence around increased risk for people in larger bodies, um, so often we're told about relative risk. So relative risk is comparing one person's rate to another. So we're comparing the risk of someone, you know, in a larger body to someone in a smaller body. And so when we look at gestational diabetes, we do see that, um, you know, people in larger bodies have about, you know, five times more likely of incurring gestational diabetes. That's what you'll read in most articles. That's what you hear care providers say. But what does that really mean? Like 50%? I don't know. Like it seems five times. Oh my goodness. Um, but when you break it down and actually look at the evidence, um, it's about 17% chance of incurring gestational diabetes. Um, and I know that number off the top of my head, but let me pull up the number for um, people who exist in a smaller body so we can tell you exactly what it is. But I think what you said, I think it's around 12%, um, but I don't have that pulled up right now. <laughs> I know the numbers for people with higher BMI off the top of my head, just not um, lower BMI. Uh, but the point is, while I'm looking it up, the point is, is that yes, there are increased risks but they aren't as astronomical as we're led to believe. And I encourage people to flip the script. So, okay, 
17%. But if I flip that, that's about an 83% chance of not incurring gestational diabetes. And the best part about, you know, any increased risk that we face during pregnancy for people of all sizes is that the number really isn't fixed, especially for gestational diabetes. So when we look at nutrition and physical activity, we can help to reduce our risk even further. So I think it's important that we talk about people's absolute risk factors, those absolute numbers, which would be that 17% versus the relative risk that just kind of is confusing of, wait, what is that? What does that actually mean? Um, okay, so I'm looking at 17, hold on, sorry. Yeah, so if someone has a BMI of, I'm looking at a bar chart, so it's yeah. a little hard to see the exact numbers. Um, but if we're looking at 18.5 to 25%, it's just gonna be just under 5%. So that does make sense if we're looking five times, then we go to almost 20%. So um, yeah, I mean, there's an increase, but it's not, it's not astronomical. You know, you just like are led to believe, oh, well, everyone who has a high BMI gets gestational diabetes. When you're like, no, they, you know, the odds are close to under 20%, it's just under. Um, so yeah. I think it's important to hold on to the truth that like, okay, that's about an 83% chance that I won't. And I can, you know, eat intuitively and um, not diet and have a new relationship potentially with nutrition that I can carry on to my children. Um, or, and I can find a way to be physically active if I'm not already that I love like water aerobics or starting a walking group or exploring your community and new trails and, you know, finding a way to be active. That's fun. I think is the key, not like, Oh, I have to go to the gym, you know, like finding ways to be active that are fun, you know, really unpacking your own relationship with food because for people of all sizes, all sizes struggle. And um, especially, you know, women have higher rates of, um, you know, eating disorders. So it's such a prime opportunity in our lives, because we're eating for someone else, not just ourselves, to really examine issues and things that we've had happen in our lives, and to, to work through them, and to know that we are worthy of amazing health care, because you know, you're going to be fighting for the best pediatrician for your kids, and asking a million questions, but you are deserving of that same great care too. And, and the most exciting thing that I've been seeing lately is the energy of new obstetricians and new midwives and new labor and delivery nurses who get it. Like I have um, a, an OB that reached out recently because they were trying to collect some data and they're like, Jen, I don't just want people of size. You know, I want to make sure that, you know, it's uh, black people and people of color in the study and that we are, you know, looking at multiple marginalized people. And I'm like, yes, please, this is so important. And so it, it feels like there is a shift and it's happening and it's, um, it's far beyond when it should be happening, but it feels like it's happening. And so everyone is deserving of that compassionate, dignified healthcare and knowing that you can fire your doctor at any point, even though there are many barriers often for people, um, but that you have options. You can, as a mentally competent adult, you can, you know, say, you know, I don't, I don't feel like being weighed right now. I want to be weighed potentially at the end of the appointment, or I just don't feel like being weighed today. We're not going to do that. If you're feeling triggered, like you have options, um, but you want to connect with a care provider who helps you to feel comfortable and someone that you can build a relationship with and feel good when they're making recommendations, because you know what, you might need an induction and there's nothing wrong with needing one. It's just when we're told that you have to have one for something that's not evidence-based, that's when we question things, because I don't think a lot of people really understand what that induction process is like. You know, I think the movies of glamorized, like, oh, you just go in and you just have, have a baby. And there's so much that happens that people aren't necessarily prepared for isn't how they wanted their birth to unfold. And so there just needs to be a lot more time, a lot more conversations, and a lot more compassion. And we're all deserving of all of those things. Oh my gosh, yes, so much goodness there. And I can see how the same recommendations as you speak, I'm just getting it more and more, I can see how the same recommendations can come from a place of compassion from a care provider, or from the opposite place of 
by derision and condescension, and they can be the exact identical recommendations that are evidence-based, but it can come from a place of, well, we're going to test you an extra time because you do have the risk of having pregestational diabetes, and we want to get you that care as soon as possible for you to have the best outcomes. And something like we we, you know, we want you to be tested extra for something because we care about you and we want to improve your, your outcomes. And this is something that you qualify for and that can help you versus like, well, you're really big. So because of that, you need all this extra stuff. Yes. Such a great example of how we talk to people right? Like people don't want to talk about weight at all. I think we should have conversations about weight during pregnancy. It's one small measurement, but it's an important one, but it's how we talk to people about size. I mean, every person of size knows their person of size. It's it's this thing is like care providers don't want to offend anyone or they don't care and they just offend. Um, And then people walk into care with cumulative trauma, right? So they're, they've got walls up. They're prepared to to, to fight, unfortunately. And so we just need to break down these barriers and meet people where they're at individually and with transparency and compassion and kindness and be able to have conversations that can be a little tricky. But if we come at them from a place of, I care about the well being of you and your baby, and I'm going to make this recommendation because I think it's in the best interest, how does that make you feel? Like this should be collaborative. They shouldn't be like, well, you need to do this and you have to do, you know? So I think we have a lot of potential to create a lot of great change. I mean, it changed my life, right? Just to have a midwife touch my body with compassion. Um, and I, I don't think it's too much to ask, but I think a lot of care providers um, in anyone who provides any level of care for people during pregnancy uh, or just in general, every human being needs to unpack their size bias. Uh, definitely. And then for every person of size, you need to learn different ways to be your very best patient advocate. And I've got a lot of that information over on plussizebirth.com and the Plus Mommy podcast on how to advocate for yourself. Because I know from firsthand experience, there are a lot of times when you just, you need that care provider, right? Like you, you can't just get up and walk away always. And you can't always find someone new. So how do you advocate for yourself? I think those things are so, so important. And I also want to help people find cute plus size maternity clothes too. So yeah, help people feel empowered and feel great throughout their pregnancy and take maternity photos and embrace their beautiful bodies. And to know that if your belly looks more like a B than a D during pregnancy, that's beautiful too. Uh, So yeah, I mean, that's the core of my work, right? It's just helping people to feel empowered about their bodies and their abilities to become parents. Yeah. Wow. There's just so much goodness and so much value. And I'm so happy that someone like you is out there. And I love the balance of not denying that they are maybe special considerations and that there may be a higher likelihood of developing complications, but it's not an absolute number. And that means that we just have to be looking out for them more closely without taking the compassion out of the picture and without the judgment. So Jen, thank you so much. Let's just review all the ways that people can find you and reach you, please. Sure. Yeah. Plus size birth.com and plus size birth on Instagram and Facebook and all the places for anything around plus size pregnancy and trying to conceive. I have that free um, guide on how to connect with a size friendly healthcare provider. I have the my plus size pregnancy guide on audiobook that covers audiobook and a guide that covers everything you could want to know about being plus size and pregnant and how to advocate for yourself. What are the increased risks? And more importantly, how do we reduce them? Not just talking about them, but how can we have a healthy outcome? Um, But there's a ton of articles and free information over on plussizebirth.com. And then the Plus Mommy podcast, um, you know, the really, the tagline is from bumps to bellies, we talk about it all. So not just pregnancy, but plus size parenthood as well. And yeah, I just really want to help people feel less alone and more supported. And yeah, and I really appreciate allies like you who stand up um, for all different types of people with different marginalizations and to help us all feel a little less alone. So thank you for having me. Such an honor. May you have the strength to continue doing the 
good work that you're doing and advocating for so many. Thanks, Jen. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning into the Happy Birthway Podcast. Head over to Your Wedded Academy on Instagram to continue the conversation. You'll find the link in the episode show notes, as well as links to any additional resources, products, and services mentioned here. If you love listening to this show, you can help it grow by sharing it with your friends and rating and reviewing it. To stay in the loop when new episodes are released, make sure to subscribe. Remember that your health needs are unique and require individualized medical advice. The podcast is not a replacement, and some of the information may not be appropriate for your specific circumstances. My mission is to educate you so that you can confidently collaborate with your healthcare team. I believe that a healthy mom and healthy baby are simply not enough. We also need a happy mom with an empowering birth experience.